Welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary and our lectionary podcast for the week. This week, our text for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 11, verses 25 to 30. Now, this text appears as uh, to serve as a bridge from the early, earlier verses in chapter 11, where the ministry of Jesus, and for that matter, John the Baptist, looks to be in jeopardy, perhaps even in danger of failing. And then it bridges into those verses in chapter 12 where Jesus establishes himself as the Lord of the Sabbath and proves really the validity of his ministry as well as its success. So we'll be paying close attention as we go through here to the distinction between those who are considered to be wise and understanding in the eyes of the world and those who are as infants are little children. And of course, Jesus, as you might suspect, is quick to not only question the world's viewpoint, but also to reverse that worldview for his followers. It's also important to note as we get going here uh, that the addressees of Jesus' words in this text uh, change. Uh, The first two verses, 25 and 26, Jesus is addressing these to his Father in heaven. And then, uh, second, we see uh, verses 27 through 30, Jesus is addressing the the people, the crowd, the human listeners who are gathered around him, those before him. Um, And before we get uh, any further, I have to, uh, of course, give credit to Dr. Jeff Gibbs for his help in his second volume of his Matthew Commentary, published by Concordia Publishing House. So we begin with verse 25 of our text. 11.25, then, we begin with this phrase, ekkaino to kairo. This is a very important uh, phrase, usually translated at that time, but this phrase helps connect now back to what we said before to those earlier verses in uh, chapter 11, uh, where it appears that Jesus' ministry is failing. Jesus prepares here to set the record straight in our text now that is before us. Uh, Perhaps you could say something like, um, it looks bad, however, the truth is, and obviously I think that's that's a pretty strong preachable theme as we consider how that relates in the world in which we live, because it does appear that the ministry of the gospel, the ministry of Jesus Christ, the church itself is struggling, perhaps even dying. You hear that even from people within the church itself, you know, dying under the persecutions of the world, the ever-changing culture of our society. However, the truth is, and we continue on then with this middle form from ekomologeo, ekomologeo, Ekomologogumai, a middle form here, uh, to confess, to acknowledge. However, uh, the way in which it's used here is uh, somewhat unique. And so if you look at how this, uh, uh, this form is used in, um, in the Septuagint, you'll notice it's often used in the context to give praise. Um, and that is preferred by, by uh, Dr. Gibbs in, in his commentary, to give praise. Then um, we continue on with ekrupsa, ek the heiress second singular form of, of crypto, to hide. Uh, that's, here we go. Or th- there we go, uh, to hide from crypto, uh, again, uh, talking about hiding these things, you know, God doing this, and Jesus giving thanks for that, and uh, the unveiling and the revealing from the root uh, apocalypto that we find later on here, there it goes, <clears throat> so from uh, to unveil or to reveal, then to uh, infants, right here, 
the, the term used here for infants are, could also be little children, minors, whatever. We have the ne te, te ois, ne te ois. <coughs> okay? Now, then looking at 26, we're going to look at these two verses as a, as kind of their unique chunk because they're both addressed to, to the Father in heaven, Jesus speaking here. We also see then in verse 26 this oidokia. Right there. And oidokia is um, to good pleasure or goodwill, satisfaction maybe sometimes. So as we look at all that, I think first it's important to note that Jesus is addressing God the Father in these first two verses, as we said. But second, the idea that is that the wise and understanding ones uh, have wisdom and understanding actually hidden from them. Uh, because it, basically they're too smart for their own good. Because of their wisdom, because of their understanding, their eyes are actually blinded because their wisdom, their understanding is put into the wisdom and the understanding of the world as opposed to that of God's. Uh, their wit it just blinds them to spirit, blinds their eyes to spiritual truths. But on the contrary, then the little children or the infants have these spiritual truths revealed to them because of their because of their understanding, uh, their because their understanding, because they're totally dependent. The idea here is a total dependence. Because of that, uh, their their understanding of things will not stand in the way of uh, or cloud their eyes. So they are capable, are able to have these things revealed to them, to be unveiled, I think we could also say. I will point this out, and I think this is a very important thing to keep track of, because sometimes I think this gets skewed a bit in our understanding of this text, certainly in our preaching of it, is that the text in no way, absolutely no way suggests that knowing or acknowledging that you are an infant or a little child, it scores no points. Just as confessing that you are a poor, miserable sinner does not make you righteous. Righteousness is a gift from God. Uh, acknowledging that you are unrighteous doesn't make you righteous. It's God who makes you righteous. I know it seems subtle, but it's extremely important here to keep in mind that in mind. Uh, and of course, we understand the reason that the wise and understanding are blinded to the truth of Jesus is that really they're looking for a Messiah, looking for a Jesus who fits in with an already existing system. They've They've established in some ways their own system, and they're looking to see how he fits into it. Well, Jesus doesn't fit into any system because he is the system. He's the foundation, if you will. Uh, we get that same ex idea expressed uh, by the familiar phrase, you can't put new wine in old wineskins. It's the same kind of, uh, of idea here, the same uh, reality being expressed. Okay, let's move on to verse 27 there, and we'll look at uh, Paradote from uh, Paradidomai. There we go. <coughs> Paradote, <coughs> uh, to know the, um, or excuse me, to deliver over. My bad. Did I say that? My bad. Anyway, Paradote, to deliver over, and then the Epigonosco the idea to know. Uh, interesting word, sometimes it has a lot of uh, extra extra uh, meaning associated with, sometimes it's uh, uh, eschatological knowledge, things like that, or a knowledge concerning the eschaton. In this case, maybe not so much that, but certainly um, there's an intensity here of something like an exact knowledge, I believe Dr. Gibbs translates it as um, you shall truly know, as a kind of an intensification here. Then buletai, to will or to wish, and bulomai, yep, there it is, to 
will or to wish. And then again, we have that uh, word again, the apokalepsi, the aorist infinitive. And so we have this long phrase here in the, uh, in the text. Let's see if I can locate it. It's right about here. Mm hmm. Here we go, starting with the Kai. Kaiho eon ohio hofrios. The um, interesting thing about this, uh, including, excuse me, including this, the apocalypse, it's an interesting because it infers, it has an inferred subject, but also has an inferred object. So, so you would translate it something like, uh, and the person to whom the son, to whom the son wishes to reveal the father. So you have both the father and the person are, are kind of indicated or uh, implied by the text here. It's, it's just kind of interesting that both of them are implied in the same, in this same phrase. So this portion of Matthew that we're looking at reveals a really strong Christology, sometimes called or referred to as a high Christology. And according to Dr. Gibbs, he uh, reminds Matthews, reminding Matthews here that the key question that's being answered there is, who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And certainly this verse goes a long way in helping us to understand that intimate relationship between the Father and the Son. It's also important now you see that the addressee has now changed from the first two verses. Now we're uh, addressing the uh, followers or the crowd who have gathered around Jesus. Um, and uh, Gibbs recommends those first two verses then, as we, and we mentioned it's the introduction, that they relate to the material that's taken place or that's been recorded earlier in chapter 11, where it looks like uh, the whole thing has fallen apart. Um, and that the first that these two verses then relate to the prior material, which also um, asks the question: If John's life and Jesus' ministry in Galilee is going so badly, is God still at work? And of course, these verses help us to understand: Yes, God is still at work, uh, but both in hiding and in revealing the significance of Jesus. Now, I, I'm going to do a little segue here concerning uh, this and the, the hiddenness and the uh, revealing of the significance of Jesus. Uh, we see this pattern begin in the Old Testament. Uh, would you, especially you see it in the glory cloud, where God reveals his presence in the glory cloud, and yet he still hides his face so man can, so man can dwell with him, so man is not destroyed by the uh, presence of the Holy One. You know, the unholy cannot be in the presence of the holy. So here, uh, as we bring this forward, in a very real sense then, the, the flesh, the incarnation, is the, the way in which the flesh of, of man that Jesus holds, or has, that the flesh of Jesus, in a sense, serves as a kind of glory cloud. It hides. You know he's God, but you don't look at him face to face. The flesh becomes that earthly tent, if you will, that, that hides him so that, the, so that the Holy One can dwell in the midst of the unholy. It's just a, an interesting uh, connection here that we see coming forward in these verses a little bit. So... The second part then, as Gibbs would say, uh, the second part of the text we're in right now, 27 through 30, then is addressed to the crowds who are listening to Jesus and the remarkable Christi Christology in these words, I'm quoting him now, further answers the question, is God at work? The answer is yes, in Jesus, but only in Jesus. I think that, that seems rather sensible to me. I think that bears some reflection as we consider these verses. Now going on then to verse 28. <clears throat> Doita 
this imperative to come. Let's see. So we have that, uh, the similarity, I think, you could point to um, from Matthew 4, uh, verse 19, as he, as he calls the fishermen to come after me, to come follow after me. And we have the very similar kind of setup here. And then the copontes, the present participle from copion, to become weary, to become tired, to, to work hard. Um, and then it's coupled up with this uh, uh, pathorontes menoi, the perfect passive participle, um, meaning to burden. There's a real, in this, this sense, in, the, uh, in this perfect form, you get this real sense, or it means to convey this sense of weariness. Not just, I'm tired, but a good nap will take care of it, but this idea of just being weary down to your very bones, wore out. You know, we've all been there at one time or another. It's just so much different than just needing a good night's sleep. You really need some serious time away. You know, they're just exhausted. The, um, so uh, as we continue on, then this, um, again, we come back up with the word anapao, pa, excuse me, anapaoso, a future form from anapao. Let's see if I can find it here for you. Here we are. This, um, this word that, that tells us to give rest or cause to rest or to refresh. So here we see Jesus encouraging, inviting discipleship. I think it's interesting and important to uh, see that all are invited to come to Jesus. No one's excluded by this. None. No one is excluded. All are invited to believe. Of course, only some are brought to faith. And yet, this is a paradox. As it exists, everyone is invited, but only some follow. Only some believe. Only some are brought to faith. But it, no one is excluded. And, and the way this is set up, it, it shows that. Jesus invites everyone. Uh, I, this is a paradox that's caused a lot of confusion in the history of the church. So it's, it's important, I think, maybe to... To, in your sermon to kind of insert, to let them see that, uh, hear that. Uh, the, in many ways, your objective and subjective uh, justification moments here, you could kind of work in and help them see that. Uh, and then on to verse 29, of course, that little word here, hate. The hate really, really is important uh, as we look at this one. The hate is uh, kind of the pivot word, if you will. And it can be taken a couple different ways, either as that or it can be translated as because. Now, Gibb argues for that. You know, take my yoke upon you and learn from me that I am gentle and humble in heart. Uh, the idea is that those who are burdened by the yoke of this world will be relieved by the yoke of Christ. It's not that you have no yoke, but that the yoke of Christ is pleasant and light, as it says. So you exchange the yoke of the world, if you will, which is heavy, wearisome, burdensome, for the yoke that is pleasant, light, the yoke of Christ. It's still a yoke, and sometimes it doesn't feel so light, but still it is pleasant and light compared to that of the world's yoke. Verse 30, then, our last verse are kreistos, useful, comfortable, be a translation, uh, partion, the burden again, and then alas, pros, light. The yoke, uh, this yoke then is being characterized as being, um, characterized by the humility and the concern of Jesus, so therefore, uh, I guess the way you would say it, the yoke of Jesus reflects the character of Jesus, reflects the character of the one who gives it to you. That the, the yoke, yeah, has, reflects the same who Jesus is 
themselves. Uh, and Gibbs will describe this now as the um, final and full refreshment of the, of the resurrection to eternal life. You know, when, when the receive that, that uh, rewarded with faith, if you were, in some way. Now, some possible preaching points as we close off here today uh, that we could consider from this text, and there are several. Uh, first of all, while Jesus separates those who are wise and understanding according to worldly standards from those who are infants or little children, he does not exclude any from the kingdom or from discipleship. All are invited. Another, the, the text helps define a very high Christology, as we mentioned. Helps identify the person of Jesus. Another preaching point here is uh, putting on the yoke of discipleship that Jesus offers actually lessens the load of the yoke or the burden that the world places upon us. And finally, although I'm sure there are others that, that could be looked at here, uh, the last one I have is that even though the ministry and the gospel, and I think this is a very appropriate for our world today, even though the ministry and the gospel may appear to be suffering defeat on all hands, defeat to the slings and the arrows of the evil world and the evil one, Jesus assures us that is not the case. However, in the, it is in the eyes of the helpless, the infants, the little children, the dependent infants, who are able to see that reality most clearly. May God bless you in your preaching this week.